the Greenland ice cap, a remote and frozen corner of the globe. Somewhere down there, buried in the glacial ice, are three American heroes that the U.S. military refuses to leave behind. A race against time and the forces of nature is underway. Well, John graduated from the academy in 38, and then in 1941, he was, I guess he went down and got his wings uh, at Pensacola. And in 1941, I went down to visit him, and that's the last time I really saw him. Nancy Pritchard Morgan is the sister of one of the missing heroes. Her older brother, Lieutenant John Pritchard, was a U.S. Coast Guard pilot flying reconnaissance and rescue missions at the height of World War II. Nancy remembers a young man with a strong sense of duty. John was nine years older than I, and he was a very gentle, generous, caring person. John always did the right thing. Pritchard's partner in the air and in spirit was radio man first class Benjamin Bottoms. Well, I only have fond memories of him. Ed Richardson is Bottom's son. If there was a serviceman standing at a bus stop, he would pick him up and bring him home for dinner. I don't know how my mother handled it. For Ed, memories of the man he calls Daddy Ben are now almost 70 years old. In 1942, Bottoms and Pritchard and their Grumman Duck biplane were aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Northland off the coast of Greenland. They were flying missions over the icy North Atlantic. At the time, they were looking for weather stations, German weather stations, because the weather in Greenland came across Iceland, England, and into Europe. So that was important. So they were out there as part of those searching to find and destroy weather stations. But on November 28, 1942, the two men bravely volunteered for another assignment, a very dangerous rescue mission. The crew of an Army B-17 was stranded on the ice cap in southeast Greenland, radioing for help about 40 miles from the Cutter Northland. Pritchard and Bottom set out from the Northland, located the B-17, and made a daring landing, the first time that a plane had ever landed safely on the ice cap. They then hiked more than a mile to the downed B-17, carried two injured crewmen back to their biplane, and then flew them back to the Northland. With a storm closing in, Pritchard and Bottoms had just enough time to pick up one more crew member, Army Corporal Lauren Howarth. The weather was getting bad on the second day, but uh, they wanted to get in there and, and see if they could get him off. So they did. And of course they didn't make it. Losing his bearings in the storm, Pritchard radioed once for help and then disappeared somewhere near Kogi Bay. One year later, on November 30th, 1943, John Pritchard, Benjamin Bottoms, and Lauren Howarth were declared killed in action. Their bodies and their plane were never recovered. Almost 68 years after the plane vanished, the Coast Guard is mounting another rescue mission to Greenland, this time to locate the lost plane and bring home Lieutenant Pritchard, Radio Man Bottoms, and their passenger, Army Corporal Lauren Howard. The flight along the coast is simply stunning. As soon as we land on the glacier, the work begins. Off we go. The first order of business is to probe for crevasses and to set up a perimeter where we'll know it's safe to walk without falling through the ice. It's also time to raise the tents. And for Lou Sapienza, the head of the North-South Polar Team, it's time to raise the colors and the black flag that honors American troops missing in action. The weather couldn't be more perfect to bring these guys home. Working under a bright sky, the team is brimming with momentum and confidence. And you think we're in here? No. Down here somewhere, would be my guess. The Coast Guard and the North-South Polar team think the plane is buried in the ice just a few hundred yards away from base camp. 
The pressure to find the plane falls on the science team, led by geophysicist Kate McKinley. Dr. Alberto Bejar is a NASA electrical engineer who designs cameras for extreme conditions like outer space and inside glaciers. Even with the sophisticated equipment, it is an inexact process. Dragging the radar unit back and forth over the ice, Kate and Alberto are optimistic, but they're also uncertain about what they're seeing. But that doesn't look like a plane. That looks like rock. I mean, it could be. Once you get down into this area, yeah. like if there were nothing down there, it would just stay fuzzy like that. Okay, look at this. See, this one's way. That actually looks like something. Yeah. See stuff like that. I yeah. Think. Okay. So where are we? We're we're right between the two points. Okay. I like that. All right. So you've been going back and forth for a couple hours. Any anything new? Yeah, I mean, we found quite a few anomalies. I mean, it's a little hard because we're picking up all the crevasses and they go really deep. So they're just like long, deep fractures in the ground. So at first we thought that's all we were seeing, but we have found quite a few anomalies out here that are pretty large and significant and definitely not natural. Mm -hmm. But um, I, none of them are the size of a plane, but it's at least a starting point. The mass Kate has located looks promising enough that the team decides it's time to start drilling. melting down. The long, thin steel nozzle cuts through the ice using a pressurized jet of 180 degree water. The goal is to try to hit a piece of the plane. But it's like looking for a needle in a haystack with a needle. Slowly but surely, the nozzle keeps going down and down, 30 feet, 40. So that's what they just checked out, and that was logged in at about 24 feet, and so they went 50. Drilling that hole, where would you, where might they have intersected that thing? Well, they should have been right about here. Should have been right on it. <laughs> Maybe they're just off a little bit. I think we're going to try a couple other locations, and I'm going to keep looking. Day three on the glacier, and the rain has rolled in, and maybe some of the initial optimism has been replaced by more of a sense of realism and determination about what we're up against here. Three days in, with all the holes coming up empty and the weather getting worse by the minute, things are not looking good. As I tie my, tighten my laces, this squeegee walk out. <laughs> Everything is slowly becoming completely saturated with water. Nice cold water. But when you're constantly wet, it just draws the heat out of you. And the water starts to chew up your gear, too. It just gets soggier and more and more fragile. If you've got it, watch it. If you don't, call your TV provider to get HDNet today.